As we said, welcome to Amazon. Um, this is Amazon Web Service Office here in Singapore. Who here is already using Amazon Web Services? Wow, 50% or more. All right, so has anybody given code commit a spin yet? All right, so good first intro, right? Something useful for you guys. So this talk was actually a code commit, code deploy, and code pipeline. I have 15 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is uh, spend most of my time on code commit, uh, but I'll try to s explain how these services fit together. Right, okay, if this is turns on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, continuous delivery and what role various services play in continuous delivery. Then we'll look at the services and then I'll spend some time on code commit. So this is what a continuous delivery pipeline might look like. So this is a very busy slide and a lot is going on there because typically, yes, in a continuous delivery pipeline, a lot does go on there, right? Um, you are quite used to you know, writing up your application code and putting it into version control, right? And then you may be also responsible for setting up a build server and making sure your builds run, unit tests are executed, maybe static code analysis, maybe an integration test. And then uh, you or somebody makes the deployment happen on production, right? Um, the way we think about uh, systems at AWS is we think that infrastructure is also code these days. With the cloud, your infrastructure is just a command line away. You just say, I want to start a new machine and deploy my code. That's, you know, those are, those are actually just pieces of code. Start machine, this, this type in this region with these properties. Uh, install Apache or Nginx or whatever, it deploy my code, pull from here, version this, right? Everything is code. So why not treat it like code? So yeah, so you can, you can basically check in everything, your code, your infrastructure stack, supporting services, third-party APIs that you are using, their descriptions, their access control. Put it all in version control, which is here, and then a build server kicks in, does your build. If the build is successful, it probably uploads and package file like a zip file or a jar file or something else to where you keep your artifacts, which are the things that you'll install. The artifacts will be used for QA slash testing, maybe load testing, and when everything is okay, then they will go into production. That's what's going on. So stuff coming in, op operations happening, and stuff going out. And you know what? Stuff goes out not to just a production. Stuff goes out to a QA environment, to a development environment, right? So they're like mini production. You are going to do testing on that. Um, this is what most of us do. It's also interesting to get some data out of all this process, monitor the process. Once you measure something, you can try and improve it. So you could, for example, have code metrics and see over time how the complexity of the code has been evolving. You could have code coverage metrics, and you could see over time, over various releases, how have you been improving your code coverage, right? Is it increasing, decreasing? Those are indicators of code quality, right? Some numbers. You could uh, use the number of check-ins per day to measure how agile you are, right? That could be an input to your process. Things like that. Uh, which means yet another tool somewhere there. Right? So that's the continuous delivery pipeline. Let's focus on a few services that you could use to get up and running quicker. The code commit is a service which is just basically managed Git. Code pipeline is a service where you can describe workflows, the previous just multiple steps that I described going to you know various environments, various steps happening. It helps you manage that. And code deploy is a tool that will make it easier for you to deploy a final shiny artifact onto <coughs> your production or development or load test environments, right? So since most of the time is gonna be spent on code commit, I'm gonna, gonna give you a quick overview of code pipeline and code deploy first, so let's, uh, but this is how this, these services fit into the big picture. So all the way from code to deployment and after uh, deployment, uh, deployment and provisioning means managing the infrastructure, deployment is deploying your application, monitoring is how well is your application doing. There are various services. So obviously code coming is related to you know where you code, you check in. Code pipeline helps you take that code and run builds and tests and kick off deployments. 
Uh, the deployments need infrastructure. So either you are standing up a machine yourself, or you're deploying, you, you created a, an environment and you just keep deploying to that again and again, or your environment is dynamic. Machines keep coming and going. Uh, so there are services to help automate that, right? If you have a deploy environment which can grow according to scale, you might like to use Elastic Beanstalk. If you have, uh, if you are comfortable with tools like Puppet or Chef, you might like to use Opsworks to do the installation, automation of configuration and stuff. And um, on either of these uh, environments or your own custom environment, you can use Code Deploy, whose one single function is to install your shiny new software reliably. All right, uh, and if you log into the AWS Management Console, you will see this cluster of services right there, these three services, and the Beanstalk Opsworks, they're also there. Right, so this is your typical uh, workflow. Uh, you have some code version running in build. Currently, you know, it's in, you've just checked it in and it's failing the build. You have some code which passes the build and you call it a beta and you deploy it somewhere and people are hammering on it. Maybe QA are testing it. Um, in AWS, there's a yet another state called Gamma, but you may or may not have it. Think of it as pre-production. Money goes to production. You may have just one production environment. If you have, you are very lucky. If you are not so lucky, you will have several, and therefore you will be thinking all the time which version is running where. <laughs> right. Um, the thing is, to move code from source to all the way here, there's a workflow, there's a flowchart, which is unique to your organization. You may have more or less stages than this. You may have more or less environments than this. Some of the uh, you may have, uh, if say uh, all the unit tests pass, you may want to automatically promote that to say uh, QA, right? If, as soon as my unit test pass, I will push that deployment to QA and that should be automatic. But you may not want <coughs> things from here to go uh, to production automatically. You may want a human switch there, right? So your flowchart could look different depending on your circumstances. So um, code pipeline is a service where you can do this graphically and you can have automated promotion of code from one stage to another depending on conditions and you can have gated ones where it won't automatically go ahead and just show a green button ready to go unless somebody clicks on it. It doesn't do the build, it doesn't uh, do the various steps by itself, what it does is it plugs into other systems. It will integrate with things like Jenkins or Cruise Control or what have you. It will plug into any uh, most uh, version control systems out there. So you just define the workflow. You say, pull from here, push to Jenkins, wait for this output. If this output, it's good to go. If the output is not, some, if output is something else, it's the build has failed. So trigger off another workflow, maybe send an email saying something happened, right? Um, and the reason you want, might want to use this service instead of, say, a shell script is that um, when you try to script all of this up, um, where's that script going to run? That itself becomes a reliability problem. You know, it's, it's only on your laptop, you are off on holiday, that doesn't run. If it's on some server forgotten somewhere, that server goes bonkers and your build system has failed. The second thing is it has a concept of retries and it, it can handle transient failure. This workflow is just a bit more robust. It protects you from having to, uh, well, I've, I've, I've built, built pipelines before where nothing was wrong except the script which was, you know, trying to kick off Jenkins for an integration test had a bug. My code didn't have a bug. Jenkins didn't have a bug. The script which was pulling, unit test pass, let's do integration test. That thing had a bug. Right? So it, it will just show up here, instead of hunting around in logs and stuff. You'll know exactly which stage is failing and what are the error messages. Alright, so once your artifact is ready, you can use code deploy. Um, we say it deploys to a fleet of EC2 instances, but it can actually deploy to any server, on or outside AWS. How it works is you basically have an agent, uh, a software agent that we provide, you install it on whatever machines. On AWS, you have uh, images with this agent already there, so you don't have to install it, you just bring up a machine. You just tell it which 
pipeline in code deploy to connect to, and it will then, when after that code deploy takes over. In code deploy, you send a command like deploy this release to this bunch of servers, right? That bunch of servers is your fleet. So that's fairly uninteresting, right? You can do it with a whole bunch of tools already, with Capistrano, with, uh, with just SFH, with Fabric, with Ansible, with uh, Chef, Puppet, whatever. So the interesting thing about code deploy is, is when you reach scale, there are some things to worry about. Imagine you have more, let's say four or more web servers running version one of the software and you want to deploy version 1.1. So you don't want to bring all of them down at the same time. You want to do a rolling deployment. But, so nothing could be easier, right? Just write a for loop with a sleep, deploy to server, for I on servers, deploy, wait, deploy, wait. What happens if for some reason, when you were installing on server one, something went wrong, there was a bug, that server never came back up you will want to roll back, right? So now there is a if, then, else somewhere there, right? Um, what happens if the first time you deploy version 1.1, there are some database upgrades to be done and it takes like uh, longer right, than usual. And once the database upgrade is done, then two, three, and four can be deployed quickly. If you want to try and build that logic, a uh, script is becoming more complicated. Things like this are, you know, they're common when you have large deployments, when you're doing things at scale. Code Deploy is a service which is help, which is designed to help you do those things, deployments at scale. So if, if, you, if your number of servers on which you're deploying is getting out of hand, uh, one shot deploy on everything is not cutting it, that's when you consider code coming. So this thing came out of the deployments done in AWS. Uh, there's an internal tool called Apollo, which, which uh, Amazon.com built for its own use. That thing has more than a million servers under its control. Uh, an average deployment of new release goes, the average size of the fleet is about 10,000. The peak is 30,000. So at one point of time, it could be deploying to 10,000 machines. Um, now, imagine all those machines are trying to pull and then sending feedback over this stage passed, that stage passed, that broke, this happened. It will retry. <coughs> it has the logic to retry. It has the logic to do rolling deployments. It has the logic to say, install my software on 10% of my fleet at a time. It can take, uh, if you have multiple web servers, you have a load balancer. It has the built-in capability of taking the web server away from the load balancer, then doing the deployment, and waiting for it to be become healthy, then attaching it back. Makes those kind of things easier for you. If you're deploying to two servers, maybe overkill, right? But very cheap, so you can always try. All right, um, not gonna go into that. I'm gonna jump into code coming, right? Um, in AWS, uh, all right, I should say a few things about code commit. So code commit uh, is managed Git, but you already have many managed Git services, right? The most popular being GitHub, so why would you ever want to use code commit? The code commit is addressing an audience which is slightly different from GitHub. It's targeted at uh, organizational code repositories or enterprise code repositories. So if you're working for a large company and you are using a Git repo, there are a few requirements. Those repos are never public, they're private. Secondly, uh, you need to have some kind of access control, who can do what, right? You don't, usually you don't have a free for all unless you are a very self-contained small team, right? Um, there may be more stringent authentication uh, requirements. Most likely the organization, if, if you are running this company, if you are the IT manager of this company, you already have an authentication system in the company. You may have Active Directory, you may have uh, some kind of uh, SAML based or OpenID based authentication system which you're already using within the organization. It would make sense if your version control was also integrated with that. So people use the same login that you, they were using to log into their laptops or to the email system. If they use the same login to log into the version control or do check-ins, then everything would be connected, right? Right, so that's the problem code commit is trying to solve. It's not trying to be the best uh, 
browser of code browser out there. It's not meant for uh, single person collaboration. You know, you uh, send a pull request or something like that. It's or clone a repo, start your own. That's not what it's trying to do. It's trying to be a GitHub, but for an enterprise for the internal use. Or if you're if you're a five person developer, five developer company working on your next big idea, you don't want your repo to be public right now. You are collaborating with external uh, people. You are outsourcing bits and pieces. You need tight control. Who can do exactly what? Then this might be for you. Right. Also make some assumptions. One, you probably already know of a perfectly good code browser that so doesn't supply you with one. It says just use a Git cloud. Doesn't give you a Git GitHub uh, desktop or some shiny client like that. It assumes that you already have a Git client that you're perfectly happy with that you probably have standardized on, so you're not going to just, uh, you don't really, you didn't come here to get a new Git client, you came here to just have a secure repo. All right. So how does it do that? So the authentication system is based on AWS Identity and Access Management Framework. So when you create an AWS account, which is free, you can also create users and groups and give them permissions. So all authentication is that. <coughs> With us, as an example, you may have a repository admin and a repository user. Repository user can do git push, git pull. They cannot do a create a repository. They can't create a new repo, maybe. They don't have permission. Um, you may have a power user and a non-power user. The power user could create and merge branches or delete branches, but a normal user can't really create a branch, for example. Right, so those kind of permissions. The content is stored in Amazon Simple Storage Service. So this is a service which is which comes with very high durability and availability. It's so your content is actually redundant across three data centers. So you're never ever going to lose your files. Um, the durability is something crazy like 11 nines. So very highly durable. On the back end, the content is all encrypted. So why is that important? Maybe if you are working on an open source project, doesn't matter. But if you are developing code for a finance customer. If you're developing code for some enterprise customer, they want tight control over intellectual property. One of the things they ask you is, how are you ensuring that this code is protected, that this code is secure? Right. So one easy way to say is, you know, it's here on uh, Amazon S3. This thing has so many security certifications. It's, uh, um, it's one of the most secure public clouds. And by the way, all the code is always encrypted. All the metadata is stored in a fast NoSQL managed database service called DynamoDB. Uh, the way it's designed is that uh, search through the uh, metadata is always fast regardless of how large your repository gets. Right. And yeah, the keys are managed in a, by a service called KMS, which is also a supported, uh, sorry, AWS managed service, so you don't have to do anything in there. Um, yeah, so very highly durable. The code is kept securely encrypted in multiple data centers all the time, right? Okay, uh, permissions. So you have lots of control. Uh, code commit comes with three uh, template uh, policies. One is full access, which means create repository, delete a repository, do anything with the repository. One is <laughs> Power user, so you can create a repository, you can branch, you can do whatever, you can't delete it. You can do just about everything except delete the repository. Pretty good, right? So you don't accidentally end up deleting. And read only, so you may even give read only access. And you can have your own custom policies, um, which you know mix and match whatever permissions you like. Um, it supports, because it integrates with uh, OpenID or SAML or Active Directory. You can have uh, multi-factor authentication. I don't know why would, who would want to use that, but in some environments, um, finance and security, those kind of environments, you need tight control to modify code, right? So you, you, you have this dongle, you log in, and then you can check in. All right, you can also generate temporary access credentials and give somebody access to your repo even maybe read-only access to your repo for a short amount of time, and then after that, the credentials will automatically expire. Nobody can do it. Um, encryption in transit, 
you, you uses the normal Git protocols, right? HTTPS and SSH. It doesn't use the baseline <coughs> Git. It doesn't use uh, just HTTP. It uses HTTPS only or SSH. Uh, so the data is always encrypted when it's being transferred. And I already mentioned when it's stored, it's, it's encrypted. Um, authentication for HTTPS, the AWS IAM credentials are used. So no username, password. There is something IAM gives you. Uh, code commit provides you with a uh, Git credential helper, which helps Git use the IAM credentials to authenticate. You can also use SSH if that's what you like. Uh, you can create your own SSH key pair or use your existing SSH key pair and upload the public key, just like you do in GitHub, right, pretty much. All right, let's look at this. Uh, I'm using the command line tools, but you can do all of this using the web-based GUI but that doesn't look geeky enough. Nice. No, actually I was trying to take screenshots, all right, and then it was becoming too big, too small, can't see, this is much clearer. All right, step one, um, I'm a super user. Uh, I own this AWS account, so I create an account called repo admins, I say. I am create user repo admins, I get a repo admin. Then, uh, I, I said uh, we give you built-in policies or we can create our own, so I'm just going to use built-in policies. So I'm saying I am list policies with this name AWS code commit full access. I get a policy, I just look at this long string here, this ARN, that's Amazon resource name, it's just, just the opaque string, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to use this here, so I'm saying attach to repo admin this policy, this, this thing. So suddenly this uh, repo admin user has those permissions, right? Cool, so I've got a repo admin. Um, oh yeah, I need to give get some credentials. How is this guy gonna log in, right? So I'm going to say AWS and create access key, and it creates an access key. The access key ID is this. This is shared. This is kind of a username. This is your secret access key, and this is never ever shared. It shouldn't leave your laptop. Right. But the great good news is that should you accidentally leak this key, um, you can go back to AWS IAM and quickly disable that. Just disable it so nobody can do anything with that key. Um, can't tell you how often this happens that open, uh, people are checking in code on GitHub and they accidentally check in code with their access key and secret key embedded in it. Property files or in the headers or somewhere, right? Maybe just demo code. And people are scanning GitHub and Bitbucket and looking for this pattern, access key ID in various formats. And if you accidentally check in your keys there, boom. The next thing is somebody has access to your AWS account, even just through the CLI, and they have launched tens, dozens of servers all doing Bitcoin mining or sending spam. It happens so much that AWS has also written a scanning tool and it sends you an email saying <laughs> we have detected. <laughs> All right? Uh, you had to do that because, uh, so what happens, right? You wake up and boom, you get a huge bill and then, why? Last, last week my bill was, last month my bill was 10 bucks. Now it's 9,000 bucks. How did that happen? And then you log into an AWS account that you normally don't use very much, and you see, oh, all these machines, where did they come from? And then you call AWS support. So, you know, just, all right, so, yeah. This thing is crucial, so you never leak it, right? If you do leak it, you can quickly go to the AWS uh, console, disable it, generate a new one, um, and figure out how that got leaked and never do it again. All right. Um, Okay, so I got the keys, right? I uh, created access key and secret key. By the way, the this thing is not stored on AWS. There's only one time you can download it and this is now. After that, you can't get, get that. So is it okay if we wrap up soon? Yeah, let me wrap up. So you put the key in your local AWS config and credentials. You, um, and let me skip that. Um, you create a repository. You can get the details of the repository. This is a, a critical bit, git config credential helper. So you put this command in git config, this, this thing. This is what git uses to use your IAM credentials. 
to authenticate. So once you have that, now you can just go ahead and um, then then you can just clone that repo and then start git push, git push. It will just work, right? Right, uh, some things are missing. Uh, kind of the biggest thing is probably no git hooks. So once you check in, you can't trigger a hook just yet, right? So you have to depend on polling, that's it. And the other thing to take note of, this code commit is available in the AWS USDs region, but it's Git, right? So it's not a big problem. You, you are anyway pushing to far away repositories. All right, I'm done. That's pretty much uh, what I had to say about code commit. Uh, you can visit the application management blog for interesting tidbits about application management, deployment, those kind of issues. And I have an announcement to make. We are. The reason I'm speaking here is because we are missing a technology evangelist who normally speaks at user group events, and we're looking for one. So if you're interested, drop us a line. Right, you know where to find us. All right, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks. So our next will be Jason. Uh, where's Jason? Is Jason around? Oh. Back here.